Hey there, I'm Gary Parrish. Welcome to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me, and we got a full hour planned for you here on CBS Sports Network with the 2023-24 college basketball season just days away. And we now know, unfortunately, uh, that the season is going to start under a cloud of sadness. And that's because on Wednesday night, it was announced that Bob Knight, the legendary, iconic basketball coach, has died at the age of 83, passed away at home in Bloomington, Indiana, surrounded by loved ones. Bob Knight was the head coach of three different schools. His career spanned five decades. He made five Final Fours, won three national championships in 1976, 1981, and 1987. His 76 team, Indiana Hoosiers, went 32-0. and That's the last men's Division I basketball team to ever finish a season undefeated. Nobody disputes Uh, Bob Knight's coaching ability or his accomplishments. He's an all-time great, but his legacy is obviously complicated. We're going to get to that in a moment. But first, Norlander, just your thoughts on the passing of a college basketball icon. Yeah, we'll get to the coaching part first here because he does carry uh, a unique and complicated legacy uh, that we must address. But from an on-court perspective, is considered as influential as any college basketball coach ever his motion offense. And we're not going to break down the X and O's for you right here, right now. We got a podcast to get through and a lot to touch on here, but uh, rest assured that it influenced hundreds, if not thousands of teams at, at all levels of the sport. Um, he didn't invent the motion offense, but he absolutely brought it to the mainstream and it was uh, a nightmare to prepare for. If you did not have the personnel and frankly, the coaching acumen and the staff to offset it, because one of the amazing things about what Bob Knight did is, yes, he had some he had some greats come through his program. You know, Quinn Buckner, Ken Benson, Isaiah Thomas, Calvert Chaney, Steve Alford like they but only one future NBA all star in a three decade span at Indiana alone. And yet the only guys that won as many or more national titles in men's division one college basketball, you're talking about Wooden, you're talking about Krzyzewski. You're talking about Rupp. They all had more than three. And then Knight, Calhoun, and Roy Williams all have three. You know, for him to get that Indiana job, GP, after getting the Army gig just three years removed from graduating college, he won a national championship as a player at Ohio State. And that kind of set him on the path to his greatness as it's associated with the winning that he did in college uh, first as a player and then for the majority of it as a coach. And then after his dismissal in Indiana, we'll get to that in just a minute, you know, he opted to get back into coaching and go to an outpost, Texas Tech, a program with very minimal history, and brought that school to the NCAA tournament, you know, four times in an in, in eight-year in eight span. And while Texas Tech has since made uh, a run to a national championship game in men's college basketball under Chris Beard and had another really deep run there and has done well uh, for Knight to do what he did, including a Sweet 16 run at Texas Tech, only it, it was... It was the the late career act that reinforced his coaching bona fides that brought him to 902 career victories, which when he retired was the most in the history of men's D1. He has since been surpassed, but uh, undeniably what he meant in terms of his coaching influence, and it's been evidenced in the near endless stream of statements that have come out in the less than a day that since his passing, um, he is someone who was highly regarded for his coaching mind and the way that he built and turned Indiana into a blue blood program. And my last thought on this, it, it was not always that Indiana met basketball meant a lot in that state. And it, certainly it was an elite program, but because of Bob Knight, Indiana became a school associated with the term blue blood along the lines of Kansas, Kentucky, Duke, Carolina, and UCLA. You touched on it, but I want to hammer home this point because if you're trying to argue uh, Bob Knight is perhaps the greatest college basketball coach of all time uh, the first thing I think you go to is that he won three national championships while coaching only one future NBA all-star his entire career it was Isaiah Thomas just um, you know for some context understand that Mike Krzyzewski had three NBA all-stars in the 2021 NBA All-Star Game, Jason Tatum, Kyrie Irving, and Zion Williamson. Coach K had three in one game. Bob Knight had one ever and still managed to win three national championships. He did it without 
even a hint of impropriety. Nobody was ever whispering, yeah, but do you know how he's getting these players or do you know how he's doing what he's doing? That has been said about a lot of coaches over the decades, including Hall of Fame coaches, but it's not really anything that was ever attached to Bob Knight. He's also the last coach to lead a team of college players to an Olympic gold medal. He did that um, for USA Basketball. And so while there are men with more wins, more Final Fours, and more national championships, I think you can reasonably argue that nobody in the history of the sport ever did more with less individual talent than Bob Knight. So unquestionably, he's a brilliant basketball mind and a brilliant basketball coach, but he was also, again, a complicated man. You can't talk about one without talking about the other. Just a list of off-the-court issues that he ran into throughout his career. He was accused of assaulting a police officer in Puerto Rico in 1979 while coaching USA Basketball. He made controversial comments about sexual assault, threw a chair during a game against Purdue, pulled his team off the court in a game against the Soviet Union, national team after he was ejected from that contest he brought a bull whip to a press conference and swiped it toward a black player he was suspended three games in 2000 after cnn aired a video of him choking a player player neil reed in a 1997 practice and then less than a year after that video aired bob knight was fired at indiana following a run-in with a freshman student unfortunately this is all part of bob knight's uh, legacy it's all part of his story. So Norlander, you handled the obit for CBSSports.com. How did you work through all of that complicated stuff? Well, there's a lot to work through, and you know, the intention with an obituary is tell the life story of a of a of a person, and and in this case, Knight, a very uh, public figure, uh, an immense public figure, and and for our viewers on CBS Sports Network and uh, and those that are listening to the podcast, we have a very deep discussion on Bob Knight that we did in an emergency episode. So once you get done with us here, I want to direct you to that and make sure you get even more context on all this because we're going to be a little more efficient on this one. But he was a, a megawatt celebrity uh, in, in coaching circles in, in the United States of America in the 1970s, 80s, and into the 90s. But uh, rightfully so, he received a lot of backlash. And there are a lot of people that did not view Bob Knight through a positive lens, uh, understandably so, and justifiably so, viewed him as a bully, viewed him as someone even out of phase with the way that he acted the w in the manner of which he acted in the 80s. There are people back then that thought um, his behavior uh, was unacceptable and a couple decades uh, past its expiration date. Uh, that's why it makes him, and I went into this a little bit on our emergency episode, it makes him truly fascinating because I don't think we've had a coach in American sports who has achieved more and commanded and garnered more respect in his profession. Like coaches across the sport of basketball revere Bob Knight for uh, what he did. And yet at the same time, had no shortage of enemies for his behavior and his conduct, a lot of it which was out of bounds and a lot of it which had it happened um, some years later would have gotten him fired sooner. But because... He was uh, Indiana basketball's God, and he has so many people who revered him and who are in mourning at his passing that support that program. It made him a divisive figure, and it has undeniably, and this is written in the, uh, in the obit that we posted at cbsports.com, his legacy endures, but for as much power as it has there, the amount of controversy that is attached to it is nearly as powerful and it's why, really, college basketball never had an analog to Bob Knight and never will. It's it's hard to even come up with names of people who are as accomplished as him in college athletics, but also as complicated as him in in college athletics. And that is a part of his story. It's a it's a real shame that so much stuff that um, has nothing to do with basketball overshadows all of the amazing things. Uh, that he did with basketball, but uh, that that is the legacy that he he leaves. And you're exactly right. Uh, there are so many coaches in this profession who admire Coach Knight as a basketball mind, uh, as a tactician, as somebody who could take a, a group of players and mold them into an an an, an excellent uh, basketball team, uh, one that 
uh, as the cliche goes, is is greater than the sum of its parts. But there's all the other stuff there that um, is, is tough to ignore. And again, it's just unfortunate that uh, on the day after he passes, uh, you can't just talk about the amazing motion offense and all of the victories that you you have to l- lump all this other stuff in there with them. But our thoughts either way are obviously uh, with Coach Knight's family, yes. including his son, Pat, who, of course, uh, succeeded him at Texas Tech. Bob Knight, dead at the age of 83. Welcome back to the Island College Basketball Podcast on CBS Sports Network. As mentioned, the college basketball season gets underway on Monday. Trivia time. Norlander, it's trivia time. I just knew this was coming. All right, lay it on me. What do we What's got? the there? first game? The first game that's going to tip off on Monday to get started this 2023-24 season. The first game, in, in, in chronological order, the first game that will actually tip off on Monday. It's 11 a.m. Eastern. Nothing tips off earlier. Is it between... I know how these things can go sometimes. College basketball doesn't exactly get off with a bang. Is it even between two Division One programs? Nope. Yeah, there's no chance I'm going to know this. Uh, okay, can you give me... Uh, just even just give it to me. I don't even know. What do we got? We got Spalding at IUPUI. Okay, how familiar Horizon. are you with Spalding? I know it makes a great basketball. That's, <laughs> That's the thing. thing. In fact, it feels fitting in that regard. IUPUI straight out of the Horizon League is your Division One program in that matchup. Uh, that's not great, but at least we do get USC Kansas State is that night, is Monday night, and uh, those are two top 25 teams at Ken Palm, and USC has the number one ranked freshman in the country, Isaiah Collier, so there's something to watch out there. So at least there is there is a game that has some marquee value, but we do both wish that the opening Monday and Tuesday as well of the season had a little more pop to it. We're not getting that this season. For those unfamiliar, Spalding is, of course, located in Louisville, Kentucky. Spalding is, I think you can safely say, the second best college basketball team in the city of Louisville behind Number one, Bellarmine. It goes Bellarmine number one, wow. Spalding number two, and then the Louisville Cardinals. I think this year, maybe number three. It's tough. It's tough. It's Louisville a tough did, situation dropped, in Louisville. Just got dropped in an exhibition earlier this week, unfortunately, did Louisville um, by D2 program. So Kenny Payne year two, this ship's going to have to turn a lot quicker. Kenny Payne year two at Louisville is obviously a storyline to follow. But heading into this season, what is, in your opinion, the three biggest storylines to follow? Yeah, narrowing this down to, if this was our regular podcast, if you will, um, which you can always watch on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel and and listen on anywhere you get your podcasts. uh, I might dive in on 10 storylines, but we're going to keep it to three here. And I'm even going to mention the fourth, which is FAU and how it looks. GP's got him fourth in his rankings. I've got him 15th or 10th in the AP Top 25 preseason poll. How FAU thrives or doesn't after making the final four is a big one. But my top three are this. Number one, it's got to be Purdue. They bring back the national player of the year in Zach Eady. He is the near unanimous pick to, to repeat as national player of the year. I think he will do it. I believe you think he will do it. We'll get to that a little bit later on the show. Purdue losing to FDU as a 16 seed last season. Uh, the just devastating irony of that loss, GP, being that FDU was the smallest team in the field. Purdue had the biggest dude in college basketball, and it didn't matter. FDU wound up winning. Purdue was spinning its wheels, and it's one of the most uh, notorious upsets if you're on the losing end of it in college hoops history. What does Purdue look like this season? You know, preseason number one in my rankings, preseason number one in all the mainstream metrics, uh, not there in the AP Top 25, but it needs to have a big season. And by big season, I mean finish maybe atop the Big Ten and make a deep run in the NCAA tournament. Storyline two, how does UConn look? They lose real talent. Jordan Hawkins, lottery pick. Andre Jackson, one of the best athletes and playmakers in the sport last season. He's off to the NBA as well. And then Adama Sonogo was the team as MVP, and they wouldn't have won a national title without him last season. We'll see if he can carve out a career in the NBA or not. If not, I see 12 years of absolute glamour and domination and an overseas career for Adama Sonogo. They're all gone. Now, UConn does bring back Tristan Newton to play point, which I think is huge. Donovan Klingon, the big who came off the bench, uh, who was used in spot duty to to give Sonogo a breather. Now he's expected to be the breakout player in the sport this season, GP. Uh, Will he do that? And Stefan Castle is the freshman to know at UConn, but does the program handle prosperity well? It was picked third in the Big East. 
What does Dan Hurley's encore look like? I think that's a pretty a pretty big story overall. And then number three, I'm going to stick in the Big East, and it's because Rick Pitino is there. You get Rick Pitino, who's a top ten coach in the game still, in my opinion. GP might even have him top three at this point. He his his record is undeniable over the years and what he's been able to do and transform programs. St. John's, which actually like Louisville, lost an exhibition. Shouts to Pace University. Um, St. John's didn't have some players playing in that, but projected in the top half of the league. Will St. John's, the storyline with St. John's is, will it compete to make the NCAA tournament in year one? Don't quite know, but obviously you got Patino back in the garden, back in the Big East, a ton of attention there. I think those are the three biggest on the precipice of day one of the season next Monday. So let me take them in the order that you presented them. Can Purdue redeem itself after that one versus 16 loss to Fairleigh Dickinson? I don't I don't know. That never goes away. That, that's always going to be something that happened. Purdue is forever going to be the second number one seed to ever lose a round of 64 game. So they can't erase that, but um, they can change the narrative connected to their program. Um, they've got all the pieces to not only win another Big Ten title and a Big Ten tournament title, but to, yes, go to the Final Four for the first time since 1980 and maybe, just maybe, win a national uh, championship. Uh, I'd love to see it. I think that fan base deserves it. I think Matt Painter deserves it. Zach Eady as the player of the year back in school. I would like to – the way that season ended, just – I can't imagine what it's like to play in November, December, January, February early March, be awesome, start to finish, set yourself up to be a one seed in the NCAA tournament, then boom, it's just over like that. That's tough to deal with. I know they've been dealing with it, those players, that coaching staff, that fan base, all off season. I, I sure, it wouldn't bother me one bit if we would look up uh, in the greater Phoenix area uh, at the Final Four. Glendale, yes. And Purdue is, is holding the trophy. Uh, I, I think that'd be a a nice story for, for everybody. As for UConn repeating, maybe they have a chance. But the problem is the reason repeat national champions are such a rare thing in college basketball is that it's hard to win that tournament even when you're the best team. Like the nature of the tournament, you know, even if you're the best team, you've got to win six games without losing any. And these are 40-minute games with a short three-point line. Um Foul trouble could dictate the outcome of it. There are just so many variables that, again, even when you have the best team, the best roster, it's hard to do. For instance, right now, Duke and Kansas at FanDuel are the favorites to win the 2024 NCAA tournament at plus 1,100. They are still wild underdogs to actually win six straight games in the NCAA tournament, and they're the teams that are most likely to do it according to to the betting market. So can UConn win a second straight national championship? Yes, UConn can. But if you're asking me, UConn or the field, I'll take the field over UConn. More specifically, I'll take the field over anybody. St. John's competing for an NCAA tournament berth in year one under Rick Patino. I think they'll definitely compete. I actually think they'll get there. I've got the Red Storm 25th in my preseason, top 25 and one. But it is true that Rick Patino has never taken a power conference school to the NCAA tournament in year one. The only time he ever did it was in year one at Iona when they finished ninth in the league and then won the conference tournament. So Rick Patino, an all-time great, but he hasn't done what St. John's fans want him to do this season, which is take a power conference program to the NCAA tournament in year one. In fairness to him, at Kentucky, he was ineligible to do it. But still, what I'm saying is a fact. He's never done it before. I think that changes this March. We'll see. Uh, I, he's got a chance. They bring, and I sat down with Patino at Big East Media Day one-on-one -on -one for CBS, and he told me, listen, and this was before the pace loss, we're bringing over guys from mid-major programs. Some of them were coming from losing situations. So they're going to have guys from Harvard and Iona and UMass and Penn. Uh, they do have Naheem Aline, who comes from the reigning national champions, UConn. He transferred there. And he, he just said, listen, it might be a little bit, and I'm paraphrasing, but it might be a little bit bumpy in the first few weeks of the season. We'll see if that winds up being the case. They bring back Joel Soriano, who I think is a pretty big a piece there overall. But um, the Big East in general has storylines galore, and we did a preseason Big East special pod that you can find in the feed. To me, it's the most compelling conference in the country for about a dozen reasons, and you see it here. It's got probably two of the 
three biggest, four biggest storylines in the sport heading in to the season. And uh, we are eager as ever to get these games going because College Hoops has one of the longest off seasons of any major American sport. And I can't wait to see what surprises are in store. Every year, GP, we get surprised by not just one thing or two things, but a litany of them. And once we get these games rolling, uh, the plots begin to unfold. I feel like I see the sun starting to peek in there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's starting to come up, I think. Yeah. All right. Are we going to be able to deal with this glare going forward? Are we going to be able to finish this show with a glare? We're doing a lot of incredible things on this podcast. One of them is literally controlling the movement of the sun and the advancement of time. It's amazing. When we come back, two-time transfers are having their waivers denied left and right. Some coaches and players are upset with the rulings. Should we also feel bad for them? Or, hey, rules are rules. We'll discuss that next on the Ion College Basketball Podcast, CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the Island College Basketball Podcast on CBS Sports Network. As previously mentioned, there are just four days until the start of the college basketball season, and a lot of schools are still waiting on waiver requests for two-time transfers to either be approved or denied. It's a big topic of conversation within the sport. Now, for those unfamiliar, players are free to transfer from one school to another and play immediately as long as it's the first time that they've transferred. But if they transfer a second time, they need a waiver from the NCAA to play immediately. And if they don't get one, they can't. Lots of players aren't getting them this year. Coaches are upset. Players are upset. Norlander, let me ask you this. Should we feel badly for them? Or, hey, rules are rules. And when you transferred for a second time, you knew that this was a possibility, if not a probability. Eh, go cry somewhere else. Well, I'll tell you what, this particular topic and doing this on our, you know, podcast as usual, but also made for made for TV episode. This is a topic where GP and I could burn 30 minutes and it would not break a sweat here. So we really have to challenge ourselves. Um, this is a major topic and a major issue because what we're going to have here is we're going to have dozens and dozens of players that get to the start of the season and they're not going to be cleared one way or the other there. Um I'm not good across the board with you get one freebie and then second time, no matter what. Not good with it. How about when a coach leaves a school and a player wants to transfer out? The player just has to suck it up and say, well, I didn't come to this new school thinking that my coach that I chose to play for would leave. I can't I can't play somewhere else again. I can't go. Mark Madsen left Utah Valley to go coach at Cal. Aziz Mandago left Utah Valley, is now at Cincinnati, and started his career at Akron, so he is a second-year undergrad transfer. But it's not. it wasn't Aziz Mandago's decision for Mark Madsen to understandably leave for one job for another, to jump from the mid-ranger ranks to the high-major ranks. So this is obviously a topic that is fraught with a lot of sensitivity, a lot of debate. Um, and I don't think that you can logically and fairly have an across the board, you get one freebie the second time, no matter what, doesn't matter. Because there are everything from viable mental health reasons to if you lose your coach, you should be able to transfer from one place to the next without exception. I think it sets a terrible precedent for the coaches to be able to do this and for the players to not be able to it, you know, take the same exact path. Bandego is currently awaiting to see if his waiver gets cleared or not. The attorney general in the state of Ohio is ready to go after the NCAA and his new president, Charlie Baker, over this. So we wait and see. I, I might be a bit of a radical on this topic because I think players should be able to transfer after every year and play immediately as often as they want. If Chris Beard could be the coach at Little Rock, take the UNLV job for a week, then decide he wants to go coach Texas Tech, then when Texas opens, decide he wants to be the Texas coach, then when he gets fired there three months later, be the Ole Miss coach. Like if that can be his career, then I don't understand why student athletes aren't allowed to move around as freely. So for um, all intents and purposes, I am on the side of the student athlete. I think the rules should be changed. But rules are rules, just like laws are laws. And there's a stop sign in my neighborhood that serves no purpose whatsoever. It should not be there. I never stop at it. Okay. But if I get caught, I will get a ticket and I won't have much of a defense because you can't run stop signs, even if stop signs are illogical and wildly out of place. So on a lot of these cases, I do look at it and I go, hey, I disagree with the rules, but the rules are, are pretty clear. And you had to know when you transferred a second time that it was possible, if not probable, you would be made to sit out a year. Now here we are. If you didn't want to be at risk of this, maybe you should have stayed where you were. That said, some of these yeah. cases are really problematic in terms of, 
okay, I know the rules are the rules, but you do have a waiver process. How did this one get denied? And the most obvious one is Jalen Tyson at Cal. Are you familiar with this story? I am. Uh, I would say it's been an under-discussed story in the offseason, but for our listeners and viewers that might not be familiar with it, feel free to uh, to familiarize them with Tyson's current predicament at Cal. So Jalen Tyson, he started his college career at, at Texas. He played one season there, and then he transferred to Texas Tech, eligible immediately, one-time transfer waiver. He started 31 games for the Red Raiders last season, but then decided to transfer after his coach, Mark Adams, was fired in part for allegedly making a racist comment. Jalen Tyson decides to transfer. He's now at Cal, and his waiver was denied, even though I'm told two different doctors have written letters on his account talking about how they were concerned about his mental health in Lubbock, Texas. One of the reasons I'm told that his waiver was denied is because he waited more than a month after Mark Adams was fired to actually enter the transfer portal. The implication being, if you were really so desperate to get out of there, why did you wait so long? But Jalen has responded to that by saying, the Texas Tech athletic director asked me to be patient and give the new coach a chance. And so I was just trying to honor what my athletic director wanted. Ultimately, I decided I still wanted to leave. And that's what I did. It is crazy to me that that waiver got denied. If you want to say we have no waiver process anymore, fine, whatever, change the rule to that. But as long as you have a waiver process, how can Jalen Tyson at Cal not get a waiver based on all the things I just explained are connected to his transfer from Texas Tech to Cal? And behind the scenes, this is what is driving a lot of players crazy, coaches crazy, athletic directors, some compliance people, because we are getting to it just it shouldn't be like this. We shouldn't be on the doorstep of the season starting and you have a litany of programs, sometimes schools with multiple players, Cincinnati being one of them, that don't know if they're going to have certain players be eligible or not. Uh, part of that goes to the NCAA uh, just severely understaffing the departments that would look over these transfer situations. I'll give you another one real quick, you know, just to show that it can affect power conference programs just as much as mid majors. Towson has a player, Nenda Tark. Okay. He's from Towson's in greater Baltimore. He's from Baltimore. He played at Coppin state nearby. Now he decided this past off season that he was going to play at, at nickel state, but he then changed his mind. He never, he never went there. He never stepped foot on campus. He never packed up the car. He, he made a decision that he was going to transfer to Nickel State, but he never enrolled there. But I was told by a source just a few days ago that a former Nickel State assistant who was no longer with the program after review, you know, impermissibly enrolled him into a class at Nichols. So he, his clock technically started, even though he never enrolled there. And so now you've got Towson trying to get a player cleared on a waiver for a two time transfer undergrad when he never even went to the other school to begin with. So my big point in, in addressing that specific situation and what you brought up GP is the NCAA being in the waiver business. It opens up, such a humongous Pandora's box of potential contradictory clearances and denials that it does make sense on some level to go all the way or it's it's got to be all or nothing. But I don't know if they're ever going to get there. And the NCAA is obviously um, aware of the fact that they could be vulnerable to being sued, whether or not they'd win or not remains an interesting one. But um, if you've been following college hoops diligently in the off season, you are this is not news to you. You are aware of the fact that there are actual impactful players that still haven't been cleared. And in speaking to a lot of people around the sport, uh, they're just looking for more common sense and logic from the NCAA. I guess good luck on that. Yeah. Again, if you want to get rid of the waiver process, um, you know, I won't uh, protest. But as long as you have a waiver process and there's a path for two time transfers to be eligible, for the life of me, I can't understand why Jalen Tyson is not eligible at Cal. The NCAA does have a history of revisiting these cases and reversing course. I hope that's what they do here. It would be the right thing to do. When we come back, Matt Norland are going to tell you about some names to know heading into this season. Who might be the next faces of the sport? Norlander's on it next. Stay on College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast on CBS Sports Network. We're about to get this season underway, and 
most college basketball fans are familiar with Zach Eady, Armando Baycott, Hunter Dickinson, guys who have been college standouts for multiple years. But what's the next batch of household names in the sport? Nerlanda, give me uh, three less popular names that could become well-known guys once the season gets underway. Well, you mentioned Edie, Dickinson, Baycott. They're all preseason first-team All-Americans at CBSSports.com. I'll, I'm not... I'll also include Tyler Kolek, Kyle Filipowski. That's our preseason first team All-American. So I'm going to take three names that aren't on that list. And these are players that I expect to be highly valuable. I think they'll be potentially first or second team All-American guys. We're going to go out West. We're going to go to the number one ranked freshman in the country. We're going to go to a player that I think could get USC into the final four discussion once we get to March. And that's USC freshman point guard, Isaiah Collier. He is physical. Uh, can use both his hands tremendously well. He's going to team up with another name that's been around a while, Boogie Ellis. But Collier is getting less buzz than any number one ranked freshman that I think we've had in the past six, seven, eight years in college hoops. Um, I guess there's a myriad of factors with that. One of them being he's a teammate of Bronny James. Oh, by the way, with Bronny James, we'll wait and see on when he winds up playing. He had... Uh, a heart issue over the summer, but LeBron has gone on record saying he is recovering well and very much intends to play for USC this season. We'll see when that is another player to know. And this guy I am super high on. I think that he is going to be one of the three or four best guards slash wings in the sport. That's Illinois shooting guard, Terrence Shannon jr. I had him as a preseason second team, all American. Uh, he can play both ways has great shooting form. I think he's going to improve. As a three-point shooter, I think that my expectation, this is something of an assumption, admittedly so, GP, I just think that he is going to turn into someone that shoots north of 35, 36, 37% from three-point range and guides Illinois into that discussion of, well, if Purdue is going to be the best team in the Big Ten, will it be Michigan State or will it be Illinois that's in that number two spot there? I love Shannon Jr.'s potential. Can't wait to watch him. And another one, I'm going to give you another freshman. And the SEC with the program that's all too familiar with having big impact first year guys. And it's not DJ Wagner, who's going to help run the offense there. It's Justin Edwards, an, a name that's in the mix to be a number one pick and a relatively down projected 2024 NBA draft. Doesn't matter if you're projected to be a number one pick. You really know how to play. Uh, Justin Edwards is a wing uh, that has amazing basketball instincts. And so long as he is deployed correctly, and I suspect he will be by John Calipari um, in a loaded freshman class, Kentucky has the top ranked group of newbies coming into college hoops. I think Edwards will be the big shine guy there. So I picked those three overall others. You asked me for three, but you know me, I'm going to give you two more Donovan Klingon at UConn expect to be the biggest breakout player in the country. We'll see if he can handle that load. And then I don't think Klingon will be the best player in the Big East. I think Ryan Kalkbrenner of Creighton will be the best defensive big man. And I think that Kalkbrenner, not even Tyler Kolek, will win Big East Player of the Year. It could obviously be any of those guys. Terrence Shannon is terrific. I do think it'll likely be a freshman. And the reason is because it is usually a freshman. You know, this freshman class isn't that star-studded. Like, Bronny James is famous, but mm -hmm. largely because of his father. DJ Wagner is famous but largely because of his father. Although can, two different kind of players. Wagner is, is, in my opinion, his his recruiting ranking was much more valid. And not say that Bronny James isn't a player. He is, but Wagner is talent combined with father. Bronny James is, is a little more weighted to LeBron. Oh, yeah. I don't mean to be dismissive of the talent. I'm just saying yeah. the most obvious reason DJ Wagner is kind of a household name is because he is DeWan's son, Milt's grandson. He's a third generation McDonald's All-American. We could throw a picture of Justin Edwards up right now. Okay. And if you didn't put his name underneath it or a Kentucky jersey on him, most people even watching this college basketball show would not know who they're looking at. So that's going to change. Maybe not with Justin Edwards, but with somebody. Because this time a year ago, Brandon Miller was not a household name, and then he became one for multiple reasons, not all of them great, but he did become one. Jabari Smith, a couple of years ago, this time, heading into the season, was not a household name, but he became one pretty quickly. As we've noted a million times, Zion Williamson was the third best recruit in a Duke recruiting class and became a phenomenon very quickly. So I think that's going to happen for a freshman because it almost always does. And if I had to pick one, I'd probably go Justin Edwards. And boy, does Kentucky need that because 
I don't know that any coach in America is entering a season, which is much uh, just fan pressure uh, at a big time school than John Calipari. And if John is trying to make it back to the final four for the first time since 2015 or win a second national championship at UK, he probably needs to circle this back around Justin Edwards to become a household name. Yeah, he needs Edwards. John Calipari needs Justin Edwards to stand out and be one of the best freshmen in the country. He may need that from DJ Wagner. Rob Dillingham is also a name to know there, but let's be clear about this. John Calipari is under more pressure in his league, the SEC, than any other coach and probably is under more pressure than almost any other coach in the country. Um, you could make the argument, is it Matt Painter or John Calipari? Who's under more pressure? Matt Painter's at no risk of losing his job. If Kentucky completely went sideways and, say, didn't make the NCAA tournament, which I don't think will be in the conversation, GP, I don't think that's going to be on the table, but Kentucky has had some letdown seasons under Cal. If it went that way, it's not unthinkable that Kentucky could make a change there. But that being said, I think Kentucky's going to be in that probably three, four seed range overall. And I think the freshman class is going to be a, a major reason why. But Calipari, and I wrote this recently for CBSSports.com, last, the past couple of seasons, he's been under an um, immense amount of pressure. But I think he enters 2023-2024 under more pressure than any previous season he's ever had while coaching, at least in college. He obviously had uh, you know, a different set of expectations when he was briefly coaching in the NBA. But Kentucky fans are about fed up. They don't want this team to take three weeks, six weeks to get its to get its groove. They want to see a team that is developed and ready to compete and winning big in November, whether he can do that with this top ranked freshman class remains to be seen. But Kentucky, of course, and as usual, ranks among the most intriguing uh, teams in the entire sport. One more segment to go when we return. It's predictions time. Who's going to be in the final four? Who's going to be your player of the year? We're going to try to tell you next on the Iron College Basketball Podcast, CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the Ion College Basketball Podcast on CBS Sports Network. You cannot wrap a podcast, it's a rule, without prediction. So let's get to it, Norlander. <laughs> Give me your final four and your national champion. I want the record to reflect. We wrap many podcasts without predictions. So um... I know, but every time we're breaking a rule. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. As we get into this, I'm going to give you my final four. And I'm gonna, I pick my final four teams based on a concoction combination, perhaps an amalgamation of teams that I think have the ability to get there, but I don't necessarily have in my top five, not even in my top 10 across the board there, because look at the final four every year. You have a team. In fact, we're on this crazy run over the past decade where you're having a team that's ranked, you know, or seated seven, eight, nine, ten. They're they're outside uh, looking in. They don't, they aren't picked there. They break through FAU being a recent example there. Um, so before I give you mine, uh, I feel like I already know Gary Parish's. And why do I already know it? Because every year, my guy says, you know what? It doesn't matter that the top four teams in the preseason never all make the Final Four. I'm just going to keep doing it. So can you defend your predictive, monotonous pick every single? You know these are not going to be the four teams that make the Final Four. You don't get to tell me what I know. <laughs> It'll happen someday. I know and boy, this. when it does. I'm going to celebrate accordingly. It just, it logically falls apart for me to say, I think these are the four best teams in the country, but I think four other teams are going to go to the final four. Like I understand that the best four teams have only once all made the final four, 2008, four number one seeds. Yes, I get it. I understand what you're saying. I just can't, it's the way my mind works. I cannot say, I think these four teams are the four best teams in the country. Now let me pick four others to play in the final four. So I always just go with the top four of my top 25 and one. It is never right, but boy, if it ever is, you won't hear the end of it. Well, we're going to get this out of the way now and it will be played later in the season. I was wrong. There we go. Um, by the way, that 2008 final four, Kansas, Carolina, Memphis, UCLA, uh, don't fact check me because uh, this is off the top of my dome. I think I think those four teams were in the preseason top five. So it is the one time, not just for one seed, just the one time the preseason poll aligned with GP's methodology. That being said, I'm turning the tables right back on you. Tell the viewers, tell the listeners, who are your four final four teams? And then I'll give you mine. Well, if you were listening closely earlier, you should know it's Kansas, Purdue, Duke and Florida Atlantic. Yes, I have the Owls making back to back final fours. I have the Owls. Make, it, I've been talking about this sport for a long time. I never thought I would ever, ever say the sentence, yes, I've got the Owls making back-to-back -back Final Fours. Even Temple Owls 
I didn't think I'd ever say that about. But certainly not Florida Atlantic, gals. But here we are. I've got Kansas, Purdue, Duke, Florida Atlantic in the Final Four. Kansas is my national champion. FAU, again, I have 15th. Uh, Dusty May has almost everyone back from a Final Four team that almost lost in the first round to GP's Memphis Tigers. Uh, if that was the case, if FAU had lost, I assure you GP would not have FAU fourth in the country. Nevertheless, we move along. I have Purdue, Arizona, Texas A&M, and yeah, I've got Texas making the final four. So all four of these teams are in my top 16. I tried to pick teams that I genuinely believe have the roster to get there. I have Purdue over Arizona in the title game. Tommy Lloyd has not been... Uh, excelling in the NCAA tournament in his first two seasons, but he's been an amazing regular season coach. Lloyd is two and two in the NCAAs. His team got punked by Princeton as a 15 seed, 15 seed Princeton last year. But I'm going to say Caleb Love really turns it around, turns his career around. Balo's really awesome. They've got the the offensive firepower to do it. Uh, Kylan Boswell is a breakout player supreme. Keep an eye on him. He'll run the point for Arizona. Texas A&M, I have six in the country, winning the SEC with Wade Taylor, the fourth. You got that right. And I think Buzz Williams is going to do a tremendous job. And I, they're a... They're a projected lead champion on my end that I think that could get there. And then I've got Texas because they bring in Max A. Smith. I think Tyrese Hunter will be among the best guards. You'll have the likes of Dylan Mitchell breaking out, Dylan DeSue having a big season. So I've got Purdue winning it all over Arizona and then two other Texas schools making it. So, yes, if you've been following along, I have Baylor as the best team in Texas, but that's not how the NCAA tournament and Final Four works. I like AM and Texas to wind up breaking through in the big bracket and getting to the Final Four. Trivia time! Final okay. Four is where? Where's the Final Four in 2024, GP? Phoenix, Arizona. Eh. Eh, well, here we go. I was wrong. It is in Glendale, Arizona. Oh, come on. Glendale, that's, Arizona is where the Final Four is. That's cheating. You know what I meant. I mean, it's factually true. What do you want from me? It's factually true. All right. Here's what I want from you. Some individual awards. Who's your player of the year, coach of the year, freshman of the year, and transfer of the year? That, of course, is the T-O-Y, the toy. Who's going to be your toy? toy? Yeah, well, by the way, we are bringing the toy to the yes. masses. We're bringing this concept here, transfer of the year. We'll get to that at the end. Uh, quick flashback. A year ago, I believe you had Oscar Shibwe as repeating as national player of the year. True or false? Probably. Sure. I was wrong. And I said he wouldn't win it. He did not win it. I will not go by that methodology this season. Zach Eady was simply too dominant. I ex expect Purdue to be too good and Eady to repeat. Um, it is hard to logically work away from him, which isn't to say I can't see it happening. And I know you would agree with me, but I think we are on the same page here. Eady is the only practical pick before we see them tip it off and play a single game. Player of the year, Zach Eady. I've got coach of the year, Bill Self at Kansas. Freshman of the year, Justin Edwards at Kentucky, and my toy, Hunter Dickinson is my toy, the transfer of the year for the Kansas Jayhawks. I'll be real quick on mine. I've got Buzz Williams winning the SEC, and we do our coach of the year on the precipice of the Final Four, so this idea is if Williams has A&M in the Final Four, he will win coach of the year for us at CBS Sports. I've got Collier at USC as the top freshman in the country and leading USC to second place at worst in the Pac-12. And then my toy... It's not Dickinson, who I think will be good, but I'm not convinced he's going to be a first-team All-American. I like Ryan Nemhard going from Creighton to Gonzaga, being a highly impactful point guard, one of the 10 or 15 best players in the country, and making sure Gonzaga has a chance to go to a ninth straight Sweet 16. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry Teagle, legend. Shouts to Huck, Larnell. And thank you guys for spending the past hour with us. If you're not subscribed to the I Own College Basketball Podcast, please go do that at Apple, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel because every episode of the podcast, it lives over there. So go subscribe. Remember, there's more of us than there are of them. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk to you again real soon. Till then, take care.